friends. Welcome to another episode, an important episode of That Sounds Fun. Y'all are going to love this. Okay, I'm your host, Annie F. Downs. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Today on the show, we are talking about something that we love to dig into around here, unplugging from all the noise. My friend Hannah Brencher is joining us and her latest book, The Unplugged Hours, comes out in September. So we're going to talk about how we do all of this well. We even recorded a little bonus conversation just for Single Purpose League to talk about the nuances of being single, but also needing to disconnect and unplug and how to feel safe and secure when we're doing that. Y'all are going to love this one. Hannah is a writer, a TED Talk speaker, and an entrepreneur. She founded The World Needs More Love Letters, which is a global community dedicated to sending letters bundles to those who need encouragement. She and her husband and daughter live in Atlanta. I'm so glad she's here with us today. And there are a lot of resources Hannah has created to help us have more balance around our lives with our phones. We'll link to all of those in the show notes below. Here is my conversation with my friend, Hannah Brencher. Hannah Brencher, welcome to That Sounds Fun. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so glad you're here. You drove up from Atlanta. <laughs> yep. You're a part of Passion City. I am, All yes. these people that I like so love, we share everybody. <laughs> Which is good. I know. You know they're good it's people. Great. What part of town, you don't have to give us your address, what part of town do you live in in, Mar- in Atlanta? I live in Decatur. Oh, yeah. I'm um, right near East Atlanta. Oh, yeah, yeah, I like to stay close. I love Decatur. Um, the Biscuit Place. Biscuit... Gosh, I don't know. There's a great biscuit place in Decatur. I'll, okay. find, I'll figure it out for you. Okay. I will tell you. People are like yelling back at us already. On I can I, hear them as they're listening to this. <laughs> okay, yeah, we got to know. I had to give up gluten years ago. So, so I'm like, oh, it won't really help. Me neither. We're, I'm very gluten-free. Okay, yeah. well, then you need to go to Hell Yeah Gluten-Free. Oh, I don't know it. In oh, Decatur? Yeah. It's, um, there's multiple locations. One just opened up in Decatur. Okay. Yeah, and you can get anything you love. It, it is so much easier to be fill in the blank free yes. now than it has ever been in the world. Because I'm like, yep. especially, well, you know, you used to live in New York, especially in New York. I can get any any food I want. I can get a gluten free version of it or a yep. dairy free version of it. Or yeah, it is such a gift. It is. It's a good time to be <laughs> yeah. gluten free. <laughs> the only thing you can't do is like white bread. White bread seems to be <laughs> the thing that has eluded all of us in the gluten free world. But other than that, I kind of get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay. I'm going to ask you our first question and we're going to talk about it because the show is called That Sounds Fun and we are in our 10th year. Tell me what sounds fun to you, Hannah. Okay. I was just confessing to you that I have struggled with this question all morning because I think I'm not a fun person, but I think I am, but I'm not. Okay. What makes you think you're not a fun person? Because when I think about like what sounds fun to me, I'm like, okay, like maybe like curl up and read a good book. But I feel like I should be adventurous and be like, I'm zip lining, but that's not happening. This is a central problem with fun. Okay. <laughs> is that people judge their fun against what they think other people think is fun. Yes. And so okay. every mom says, I'm not the fun mom, except the ones who are the adventure moms. Yeah. Right? Okay. The Enneagram sevens. Yep. People <laughs> always assume they're fun. The the my encouragement to you is if your fun is fun to you. It is fun. It's fun. Okay. And there are more people who agree with your fun than you realize, but everyone seems to remove themselves and really judge their fun because it doesn't look like a zip line. Okay. Well, it's not a zip line then. I would say fun for me is, gosh, like a quiet early morning with some coffee, a good book. Yes. Maybe later, a true crime documentary. Okay. That's it. That is fun. That's fun. If that's fun to you, sis, that works for me. I mean, I think you are... That is a very fair answer. Okay. We talk to people a lot about not judging their fun because gonna... it actually spirals into judging yourself for a lot of things. Ooh, that'll preach. Right. Yeah. Fun is such a great door to a lot of things. And one of the things is it tells you if you don't think you're fun, you might not think you're smart. You might not think you're pretty. You might not think all these things that outside forces have told you Hmm. this is the standard and you aren't hitting it. Wow. And it's not true. Okay, I can go home now. Right. I I mean, listen, I know as soon as you started saying, I'm not sure I'm a fun person. I'm like, oh, I love this. I love it because everybody is the fun mom that their kid needs. Yeah. Like every one of you is the fun mom your kid needs. It's so true. And she loves me for the things I find to be fun. She wants to sit next to me and read. She's not on Instagram. She doesn't see what other moms are doing. And she she doesn't, I mean, the majority of kids think their mom is fun until they are told differently. Hmm. 
That's beautiful. And often it's the mom who says it before anybody else says it. Okay, well, I'm fun. Yeah, no you're fun. If you're listening, I'm fun. Yeah, she, you're a fun <laughs> mom. Um, okay, I have been dying to have you on the show. How many books have you released now? This is my fourth. Okay, that's yes. what I thought. Mm-hmm. I thought you had a couple. Go through the other three for us. Okay, the first one was If You Find This Letter, and then Come Matter Here, and then Fighting Forward, and now The Unplugged Hours. Okay. This, I think, I I mean, I was saying this to you a minute ago. I think this is the book we all like. This is the concept we are all feeling somewhere in our guts. Yeah. Because in the book, you say that as you did your unplugged hours, which is literally unplugged from your phone, from Mm -hmm. socials, from technology, you started to realize you were becoming the woman you missed being before this. Will you talk about that? Because I had a profound moment with that line in the book when I read it. Yeah. Ooh, I'll start crying immediately, but that's fine because that was actually one of the parts of it was that I used to be the person that could feel everything so deeply, and then the more I had tech in my life, the less I could feel anything at all. Wow. Um, And it was an unexpected side effect of the unplugged hours. I think when I started unplugging, I was like, I want to reclaim some time. Maybe I'll get more focus. I'll be more present with my family. Um, But the more that I did it, the more I realized I was getting back to the person who was there before all that noise got in. Mm. And what was kind of sad was that I didn't even realize that I had lost her. Oh, interesting. And so for me, like, you know, 10, 12 years ago when I got onto the internet, um, I was way more creative. I was more wonder-filled. I wrote fiction. I didn't write nonfiction. You wrote novels. You said you wrote a novel novel a year. Yes. Every November? (laughs) NaNoWriMo? Is that what you were doing? Oh, I was like nine. Oh, my gosh. I spent all year writing the novel, and then I would, my mom would take me to get it printed, bound up, and I would give it to all of my family members for Christmas. Wow. And it was like my year-long project. Um, That's crazy. But the moment I started blogging, I stopped doing fiction Mm. because it was less about imagination and more about what's happening in daily life. And that can be beautiful, but that can also become performative Mm. so quickly. Um, And so, yeah, like I can look now and be like, wow, I feel more myself today than I have felt in the last decade. Mm. And I didn't even know I was looking to get that back. But If you ask me how, I'm like, it's definitely from unplugging that I've gotten back to what matters to me. And that's because there were a lot of hurdles along the way where I believed, oh, that should matter to me. So I'm going to chase that thing. Mm. Oh, I'm going to do that thing. Oh, they like when I do that thing. I'll do that thing. And more and more you lose the sound of your own voice inside of you. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. I When I read that part of the book, I remembered – Being when I taught school, I used to teach elementary school. I taught two years in Jackson County. I lived in Georgia. I grew up in Georgia. Yep. Two years in Jackson County, three years in um, Woodstock, Georgia. Woodstock. And I remember my the day I waited for was the day that Real Simple came in the mail, the Mm -hmm. magazine. Yep. Because Mm -hmm. that was what I would I was waiting to read Real Simple, and I like would save it. I'd read it as I was going to bed, and 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 I thought I miss. Her, and I and so it started me on this path of like, what did I do after work? Right. What did I do after like, if I had no Instagram to look at, would I just go to bed? What did I do? So I've had been like, really thinking back to yeah. pre. I started blogging in like um oh six oh five oh six yep. something mm-hmm. like that. You were right at the beginning. Yeah, and so I was thinking about again. It was also twenty years ago, but you've really had me assessing. Who would I find? Because mm-hmm. there's ways I don't want to be her again. Yeah, totally. I'm 20 yep, years yep. more mature. But there are also ways that I'm like, oh man, what did I, what did I do? What did I love? Yeah. What was it? How did we? Yeah, I, I, it's it's messed with me a little bit. Oh well, I'm happy to have that happen because I know on the other side of that is some of the parts that you actually didn't intend to lose that you can get back. Yeah. You know, how deep do we need to think about this? Like, I'm thinking about the mom who's listening to this while she's like doing the laundry. And because we don't want I don't want people to stop using technology because that's how they're hearing us. No. And I think that that's kind of become for me when I started unplugging, I wanted to know, can we strike a balance? Because I do love that's the question. I love the fact that. At the end of the day or in the b- morning, my daughter can have a FaceTime breakfast date with my mom, who's a thousand miles away. I FaceTime my nephew 
every single morning while I'm doing my makeup. Yep. And we love tech for that. And I honestly, I love being able to get on social media and see people from college and see people and like what they're doing and like getting to connect in that way. And so when I started unplugging, it wasn't like I wanted to throw out tech because I was like, this is where my job happens. This is where a lot of our jobs happen. Like we have to be on email. We have to be to some extent plugged in. And so the question was really, can we strike that balance? Mm. And I feel like now on the other side of like thousands of unplugged hours later, I'm like, yeah, I think we can. Like, Mm. I don't look at tech anymore and feel exhausted by it. And if and when I do, that's just a signal to myself, okay, rein it in, better boundaries for this season that you're in. But I can honestly say I get on a social media and I actually enjoy it now. Like, which for a long time, I wasn't. I wasn't enjoying it. Now we're doing um, descriptive, not prescriptive. Yes. So I want to ask you some direct questions, but I also want our friends listening to hear me say that doesn't mean Hannah's life is your life or Annie's life is your life. Absolutely. But I would like to hear when you say get on social media, what does that look like for you? Do you check it? At the same time every day, do you what 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 does it look like? It changes in different seasons, um, like whether I'm gonna have to be more plugged in or not. But I feel like the core of it is doing the actual unplugging in different parts of my day. That's what refuels me to then be able to step onto these apps and not have them take from me. Okay. And the bigger thing for me, rather, what time of the day is it? Is am I stepping onto this app? on purpose? Am I stepping in intentionally? Am I here to engage with people? Because I don't want to just sit there and scroll mindlessly. Mm -hmm. I want to use social media for what it's for, to Mm -hmm. be social and it's media. Um, And so days where I'm not feeling it, those are the days where I'm like, I should not get on these apps, you know, or I got to turn the phone off completely. But the goal is really, okay, can I show up and in my sphere, encourage people to keep going and use this as a medium and an avenue to do that, um, but not be like a lurker in the background and also not stay on the app so long that it's going to start taking from me. And so it used to be that I was on them all day, every day. And if I'm in the checkout line, I'm on social media, I'm over here checking emails, even though I don't have any intention of responding to that person right now. And what I started to key into was like, if I was face to face with these people, this is not how I would ever treat them. This is not how I would ever want to interact with them. And so can I add more humanity into the way that I use social media? And so that changes for every person. But for me, I'm like, I think I can show up here and still be deeply intentional and then get off the app and go about the rest of my day. Shauna Nyquist taught us a couple of years ago, I think on the show, I maybe in real life, but I think on the show, um, about the power of having a um, book on your phone all the time, a mm, Kindle book yep. on your phone. Because mm-hmm. then she's like, when my inclination is to pick up my phone, yeah. the phone is not the problem. You can pick up the phone in yep. the checkout line, but what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. Yep. And so I try to keep a fiction and a nonfiction all the time on my phone that are Love just it. my like waiting books. Yep. So that there is, and one of them is Practicing the Presence of God, which you talk about so in good. this book. But it is... um I, I am not great at this. This is very hard for me. Yeah. One of the reasons I really want to quit the internet, and I just haven't yet, but I'm really considering it. <laughs> uh, sorry, everyone listening. But I, <laughs> I, 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 I cannot get a healthy, enjoyable balance with this thing. Yeah. But it is also my job. And I think... Honestly, I think it's different for every person and you have to assess what you need for yourself. Because right. like I didn't know, but I remember being like, you know what? I used to love this and I used to love blogging and it was really fun for me. And I reached a point, I think it was like maybe a couple hundred hours into the unplugged year that I was like, okay, we need to figure this out because if this is not fun anymore, I am not doing this because mm. this is not some like this is not my well, it is in a sense a job, but yeah. um It was something where I was like, I need to figure this out because I used to love this thing and now I don't. And what I started doing was I started hacking my creative process and I started carving out more space to write and create, which is the thing that I love. And then out of the overflow of that space, I started to share. 
And it stopped taking from me because what I realized I was doing was I was either getting on the app for no purpose at all or I was getting on the app trying to figure out what to post. Mm. And that was just draining. And so now I'm like, oh, okay, well, what I loved about being somebody who creates content is the actual creation space. And I've reclaimed that in my life where I can have that space and then, oh, I feel I want to share from this. And when you say the app, do you mean Instagram? I think it's mainly Instagram, I would say, is like the culprit. But we are seeing like especially with the research, like a lot of people are spending time on Instagram and TikTok. And TikTok is even worse for your brain. Like we are forgetting how to be able to ingest information and digest information because Mm -hmm. our brains were not created to take in this much content at this fast of a rate. And so I think it doesn't really matter what the portal is or the medium is so much as it's like, oh, okay, like, this is not how we need to be spending our time. Yeah. We have a TikTok for Annie F. Downs. I, before I, when we were thinking about doing it, I thought, okay, let me put on my phone and just watch some of it. Let me even see what people are making. Uh And I mean, I had nights where I would watch for hours. Yeah. And then I came back to work and I was like, I'm sorry, I have to delete this app. I, there (laughs) is not, with Instagram, I think there is a healthy path. I can't find it. With TikTok, for me, there is no healthy path. Yeah, yeah. And so, it, because I'm not creating, I'm only taking. Yep. And so it has been really interesting difference to go, okay, for me, that particular app, there is no path for me. Yep. And therefore, Absolutely, yeah. no matter what professionally is, I'm told, no matter, I, that app is not for me. Yeah. That app can be for Annie F. Downs. For Mm -hmm. at Annie F. Downs, that is not for Annie to have on her phone. Absolutely. And that's the boundary right there. And I think each person like listening is like the boundary may be different for you than it is for me, than it is for Annie. And it's like I always so I create these lists. uh, They're called my what's not working. Oh, I have it on my notes. You wrote about it in the book. I think it's fascinating. (laughs) And I will if I'm feeling stressed, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm feeling fatigued, whatever it is, you know, you get that sense in you that you're like, something is off and something needs to shift fast. And I will pause, power down, and I will create my what's not working list. And then with each thing that I've written down, I try to ask myself, okay, is there something small that I can do right now Mm -hmm. or in the next like few days that's going to look like shifting back in a better direction? But I have always seen if something's not working, it usually means I am too plugged in. And that's not necessarily like for me, it would be like, oh, well, I'm checking email at night when I'm not responding to email. And so then I'm anxious over things I know I need to do, but I'm not in the space to do them right Mm -hmm. now. And that's taking me away from my husband. It's taking me away from my kid. It's taking me away from my friends. Um, But yeah, those lists will always be like, oh, well, that's interesting. I need to drink more water or I'm always snapping at my kids and it's Mm -hmm. because I'm scrolling, seeing something I don't like and then projecting it onto everybody else. And so it's kind of like an inner inventory, but I've had to learn to parent myself better. Yeah, that's right. Because like I look at my daughter and I'm like, okay, she needs rhythms and routines. She would ideally love to eat Jenny's ice cream every night for dinner and watch shows. Like that's what she wants to do. Exactly. I'm like, me too, girl. Right. But I have to steer her in the right direction. But what I don't understand, like kids or no kids, is why we're not like, I need to implement that kind of self-discipline for myself. Yes. I need to say, okay, what does Hannah need and how do we get that to her? And do we respect her enough to do that for her? Well, I can tell you why. I can tell you why as a single woman. And when I'm thinking about my single friends, but also some of my mom friends, is ice cream and TV and Instagram make us feel not lonely. That's they true. are they are coping techniques. Yeah, totally. So it is very hard to parent yourself and discipline yourself when you are hurting. Yeah. And yeah. so so how do we identify if our relationship with the apps on our phone is an unhealthy coping technique or if this is okay? How do we determine if it's healthy or unhealthy today? Yeah, so the way that I kind of frame it is like I like to do check-ins with myself. Um, And years ago before I started unplugging, my checking in was getting on social media. And it was like, you've had a long day. You want to like do some self-care is what I would say. And I thought that scrolling was self-care. And at the same time, I'm also like – 
I wanted to write this book in a way that there is like no shame, only grace, because this is a hard topic. It's totally. a hard topic. And it's not our fault that we have become this addicted. Like mm-hmm. we've had something working against us for more than the last decade. Yes. But for me, I had to come to grips with the fact that I was like, OK, I am scrolling and it's not helping me. It's making me feel worse. Mm -hmm. Is there another way that I can check in with myself? And that doesn't mean that like I don't scroll from time to time or that I get it perfectly. One of the things I started doing this summer particularly is I took my Bible and I put it on the countertop, which is a spot that I frequent throughout the day. And I challenged myself to say, before you pick up your phone, Mm -hmm. can you just check in right here? Mm -hmm. And it has been the most life-giving routine yeah. that I never anticipated. Yeah. And I would just like open it up and I would pray, God, like, show me something I haven't seen before. Yeah. I'm not doing anything in depth. I'm not doing like an exegetical study. But I read a line or two. I'd scribble a little note and then I'd go on with the rest of my day or I would pick up my phone for whatever mm-hmm. I need. And mm-hmm. so that's what I mean by like that balance is like you're not always going to get it right. And I understand that the tools, like, we want them because we don't want to cope. And I'm not telling anybody, hey, go cold turkey, turn off the phone and, like, figure out what's going right, on. Right, 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 right. Um, But check in with yourself. Yeah. Like, check in with yourself, whether that's for five minutes, whether that's for 10 minutes, to say, am I okay? And is there something that I need right now that yeah. I'm trying to fill a hole for? Hey, friends, just interrupting this conversation to tell you about one of our incredible partners, KiwiCo. Listen, I know when your kids are back in school, it means all the weekend birthday parties, and you know what makes a super fun birthday gift? KiwiCo. There truly is something for kids of all ages. There are different KiwiCo crate options based on age, and they have the cutest projects. There's everything from an adorable magnetic car set for littles to doodle kits that inspire crafting for older kids, y'all. They're all so fun. Plus, every KiwiCo crate crate comes with everything you need, materials and instructions that are really easy to follow. So whether you've got toddlers or teenagers, KiwiCo has got something for everyone in your family. And these hands-on science and art projects are both fun and educational. Each kit comes with enriching content and activities to make the learning experience even more fun. KiwiCo is such a great way to encourage kids to get outside, to explore, and to stay off their screens. They get to work on things like little planters, and they get to decorate and and succulent garden they can make out of felt. I wish we had these crates when I was growing up. Redefine learning with play. Explore projects that build confidence and problem-solving skills with KiwiCo. Get 50% off your first month on any crate line at KiwiCo.com with the promo code that sounds fun. That's 50% off your first month at KiwiCo.com promo code that sounds fun. Remember that link and every other link you could ever hope for are in the show notes below or we will send it straight to your inbox on Friday's AFT Week in Review email. You hear me say this a lot, but the places that are getting the best of our energy right now are right here on the podcast and that Friday email. So you want to make sure you are getting it. Okay, now back to our conversation with Hannah. The idea of the what's not working lists I love. Now, for a peek behind the curtain, everyone listening, we're recording this the day before our biggest weekend probably of my career and and of our team's life with the Ryman. And so this is not the weekend I get to do this. But I've been thinking, um, okay, next weekend on my Sabbath, I want to make a list of what what is not working. So my brain said, because I'm an Enneagram 7, because I tend to save a lot of my pain and grief for my Saturday mornings, mm-hmm. um, that's how my, I've balanced my life and how I make myself feel some of the feelings I don't love. I also put things like what not, what's not working list on Saturdays. Yeah. How often do you do that list? Is this a daily thing we should actually do or is this a quarterly thing? No. I mean, well, it could be quarterly. I would say daily would be hard. Yeah. Um, but I personally do it when I hit a point of just overwhelm. Okay. And I know it. Like I I can feel it and I'm like, hold up, something's not working. Got you know? It. Okay. And usually it's like 
I feel like it happens a lot like in my work days, like I'm not focused, I'm scattered, I'm kind of all over the place and nothing is getting done and I can't focus. And that's when I will stop. I will shut off. I will probably go and take a walk around the block if I'm able to. But like I'll get out of my head and do something physical first and then come back to the list. And that list can sit on your desk for the next quarter or the next month because chances are you can't overhaul it today. The Mm. overhauls within discipline, they don't really work. But like, I try to look at it, you know, I posted something last night about um, putting my vitamins on auto ship. And I was like, I did this for future me, you know? Yeah. And I try to frame it that way of like, when this feels hard, can I do it for future me, you know? And asking yourself, okay, like, future me is going to love that we did this. Or future me is going to love that tonight, We're going to, before we watch that show, read a chapter of a book because Mm. we've said for so long we wanted to read more books. And so while I understand, like, we want these tools because, like, we feel like we're hurting, at the same time, there's a reality moment where I think we have to realize we're actually hurting ourselves more, Mm. you know? And it's like, you've said for so long you want to read books, you want to write cards. Go to bed early. Go to bed early. Have a nighttime routine. And then you get to the end of the day, you've got no willpower left in the tank. And it's no wonder that you're like, you know what? I'm just going to watch Traders and eat my Jennies. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes, though, watching Traders and eating Jennies, that's the thing that is taking care of you. But having a time and place for it rather than this is every single night and then every single night I go to bed mad that I didn't pick the rhythms I actually wanted. Yeah, that's right. And John Eldridge teaches that what you do between 5 and 10 on a Tuesday night determines what you're doing between 5 and 10 on a Wednesday morning. Like how you treat Mm -hmm. your evening is going to determine whether you are able to be who you want to be the next morning. Yep, absolutely. And and it's the other reason that I'm like into puzzles, into cross stitching is because I found myself double screening all the time, mm-hmm. watching a show and scrolling on Instagram. And I was like, I've got to start doing something else with my hands if I'm going to sit here. Yep. Or yep. now that my, my treadmill now has TV on it. Thank you, Peloton, for updating that. And so now I can also walk if I'd rather walk while I'm yeah. watching a show. Yep. Um, but the double screening. I do it all. The, I mean, I'm t- I'm talking like I'm working on a puzzle every day. I'm not. I'm double screening <laughs> all the time, but I have tools now that I didn't have yep. when that happens. Yeah, and that's where I think grace for all of it because honestly, like, there's a chapter in the book like called "We Try Again." Yeah, um, so good because I'm just like, yeah, like if you're. I had a friend come to me and she's like, okay, so what about the days where it just like doesn't work and yeah. we are on our phone all day? Yes. And I'm like. We try again. And as long as we are willing to try again, we can't fail, you know? But, like, realizing it's actually, like, I'm not saying throw the phone in the woods or, like, go off the grid. I'm saying, like, can you reclaim 15 minutes to feel more like yourself? Yeah. Because then you will have fuel in the tank to do some other things, you know? And we need that for everyone. Like, we need that for you to show up to your job, for you to show up to your kids, for mm-hmm. you to show up to um, the people that you're serving or the ministry that you're working in. It's mm-hmm. like these are little ways to actually fill your tank up so that you have more to operate from. Yeah. You do a beautiful job in the book. Um Full stop. That's a that's a full sentence. You do a beautiful job in the book. But you also do a beautiful job talking to content creators mm-hmm. about – the power of walking away from the internet, that you do not have to be creating seven days a week, 24 hours a day in order to be a successful content creator. So will you talk to the people for a minute who are maybe in the seat like you and I, where part of our job is interacting with people, but there's also people who are proper, like, like to know making a ton of money and think I can't take a day off every Mm -hmm. week because our family is surviving off of me showing the clothes I just bought at Walmart. Absolutely. And I and I get that. And I I feel that I'm in that. Um, But I was burning out. I mean, I was exhausted and I would see a rhythm like Sabbath. And I mean, I used to practice Sabbath and then COVID hit. And I was like, I can't practice Sabbath. Oh, my gosh. This chapter in the book is fantastic where you. you talked about how COVID the guy who in the middle of the night would say, yeah, just stop scrolling from like 11 to 2 a.m. I had, I missed all that during COVID, but I can't, I think it's so fascinating that COVID stole Sabbath from you when we actually were home more. Yeah, because I'm, well, so I was, when everything shut down, I was nine months pregnant and they took the birthing parents out of the, um, they took yeah. the birthing partner out yeah. of the 
whatever room it is that you give birth in, um, in New York City. Okay. So my doctor was Y'all like, lived in New York at the time. Oh, y'all weren't already in Atlanta. No, we lived in Atlanta, but I went immediately to my doctor because I knew people that I'm were- I'm sorry, le- I'm sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I knew people that were leaving New York to go give yes, birth other yes. places. And my doctor was like, hey, like this week it can happen, but- I can't tell you what's going to happen next week. Wow. And so we're living with the anxiety of like, what is this going to be like? I've never given birth before. I don't know what's happening. The world is shutting down around me. Um, and I would stay up at night doom scrolling because I thought if I could just get more information, maybe I'd feel OK then. Mm. And so when it came to like Sabbath, I was like, well, no, I need to be on my phone because this is the only way. This, this is, is my lifeline. Yeah, this that's is my exactly coping right. mechanism. That's right. And I always say, I think like a lot of us, we packed a bag in COVID, but then we never fully unpacked it. Mm. And I said, I I can't even tell you, my husband is probably so annoyed by the amount of times I said this throughout the pandemic, but I was like, we're not going to have a family meeting, are we? Like, we're not. Like, there's not going to be any big collective family meeting where we say, hey, how are you Mm -hmm. post COVID? Mm -hmm. And I don't mean like our family. I mean, like all of us, we need a family meeting. And I was like... That's what I was afraid of, is that we would slowly go back to regular life, yep. but we would go back with so much baggage that we don't know what to do with. Yep. And that was the tipping point, I think, for a lot of us was like COVID made it so that we needed our phones. That became yeah. a necessity. Yeah. And now we're back to whatever the new normal is, and we're still so connected, but we're so tired because we didn't debrief yeah. and we didn't pick up healthier yeah. habits for ourselves. I have not written... I've written um, 11 books. I have not written a chapter book since COVID. Wow. I wrote all the books I've written by 2020. And I've had, we've had kid books, kids books comes out in devotionals. Yeah. But I have not written a chapter book since COVID. That's wild. I know. And I'm on deadline now, so it's going to happen. Yeah. But it, I am finding it so much harder than it ever was hmm. before. And I think it is a lot of what you're saying of, the immediacy of the internet yep, and how it is there is always more content there's always more things made there's always something to look at is making it harder for me to write a book totally i mean i wrote that book completely on yellow notepads really <laughs> you hand wrote your book I hand wrote the hannah book. but that was okay so the first time the That's first insane. book i ever wrote when i you know i got the book deal in 2015 and yeah. i wrote that whole book on yellow notepads you're a crazy person what I, that i love a good yellow notepad but that was one of the things that i completely got away from the second book typed the third book typed hannah you handwrite books you're actually not crazy. You're brilliant. You're actually you, brilliant. I'm you are the best of you, us. There is a different process that happens when you handwrite. Like Yeah, it would take for actual ever. It, well, I mean, this <laughs> is this is seventy thousand words, sixty thousand words that you hand wrote. Yep. Yep. My stomach hurts. And it, there's no efficiency to it. I have a filing cabinet in my office just full of yellow notepads. I don't know where. And then you just typed it up? Yeah, so I would treat the yellow notepad as the first draft. Okay. And then I would go to the computer later in the morning and I would start, oh, I didn't like that sentence or I would take that away or... And it redeemed the process for me. It really did. And I think the other thing that I did that kind of helped me come back to life is I didn't share any of the process with anybody. I did it for myself. And that's why it's like, I can look at the book and be like, wow, That's a good book, and I'm proud of it. And I don't know when's the last time I could say that of Mm -hmm. my work because Mm -hmm. I got so used to needing other people to tell me it's good. Oh, interesting. Getting the likes, getting the comments. Yeah, or like when you're in that process and you're like, I'll just share this, and I'll just share this, or I'll get feedback as I go. And so, I mean, I created it completely unplugged, and I had to learn to say it's enough and it's good enough because you have partnered with God to create this. Yeah. So I guess my question that is, I'm blown away that that's how you wrote this book. <laughs> My question for our friends listening, the unplugged hours. You, you Also, I want everybody to know the book comes out in a couple of weeks, but there's resources already available. You can go ahead and pre-order and get a bunch of stuff so we can start having this conversation right now in our own heads and with our people. Yep. You give a chart of how to log a thousand unplugged hours. This is all free on your website. Mm-hmm. I've downloaded it to do it as well. A hundred un- unplugged hours in a month, a thousand in a year. And then you did a summer one as well. But how unplugged is unplugged? Does your phone have to be off? What what are you what are you calling unplugged? So I always tell people you have to define what your unplugged hour means to you. Okay. And so 
For me, typically, I like for my phone to be off or at least away. So like when I can't turn it off because somebody might need to reach me, I had to stop saying, okay, the excuse is somebody needs me, so I have to be plugged in. And I got a little tin box from Ikea, and I throw my phone in I love the tin box. Yeah. Yeah. And you, like, close it up. Close it up. That's it. Um, And there's so much, like, tech that's coming to the forefront now that's helping us, like, create these parameters. Which is also should tell us everything. That the forerunners in tech companies are now creating ways for us to not interact with our technology. <laughs> yes, totally. Are, wow. And I this is something that's evolved over time, but I think so much more like than just like okay, what are the rules and regulations of an unplugged hour? I think what matters more is where are you placing your attention? That's the mm. big thing because me and my husband, like, we we do something called Pizza Fridays where we will, like, make a pizza or order a pizza. We started to invite friends to it. And then we pick a movie and we watch a movie. To me, that's unplugged. We can be watching a movie, but if we're watching it together and we're not double screening, we are enjoying yeah. a movie together. Yeah. yeah. And so don't be – I would say don't be so hard on yourself of what's unplugged or what's not unplugged. But figure out the things that are stealing away your attention – and then try to come up with some remedies to to get back your attention. And that's why, like, if you download the trackers, each little bubble is a representation of an hour you claim back. Mm. And, you know, you can be meticulous and, like, track everything you claimed your time back for. Or some hours are just going to be hours. And yeah. I think that that's been a really valuable lesson for me is that it's like not everything has to mean something. Uh- Say it. Yes. <laughs> like, uh, you wrote about that beautifully in the book of like everything is not product. You don't have to do productivity yeah. all the time. Because I'll tell you what, when I put my phone down at home, I think, OK, what can I get done? Yeah. Which yeah. closet can I clean out? Which And so suddenly I move from doing to doing. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And that's and that's where I'm like, OK, can I can I pick up a book? But then. Do I have to, like, tell everybody I'm reading this book? And will I only feel good if people know that I'm reading a book? Like, it's like all of this stuff I didn't even realize was wired so deep in me because we're so – we like to share everything, you know? And I remember it hit me. I, like, gave this talk at um, a gym on presence, and they needed examples of what presence was. And I was like, oh, so this is where we're at. Like, this is our baseline is that we don't even know. Like, this generation coming up will never have a solid example of what real presence looks like. Mm Um, and there was somebody that was like, I think I know what this means because I will be somewhere and I'll be in the moment and loving the moment, but then I will want to pick my phone up Mm. to document it, to Mm -hmm. tell people that I was here and the moment goes away. Yeah. And I'm like, yes, absolutely. Like, and it, it, that's what I had to learn was like, can I stand inside of a moment and not have everybody know that it happened? And is it still enough for me? Yeah. And if it's not. Uh, something has to change because I can't live this way. Yeah, right. I take a month off every year on yeah. off the internet in the summer during yeah. my Sabbath. And what I noticed in June this year, two things, a lot of things, but the two, <laughs> the two of the important things to tell you, one is I took way less pictures, yeah. which I thought was really yeah. interesting. I was like, wait, why are you not taking? I was just at things Mm -hmm. instead of like documenting them. So I was like, well, if you're going to actually have a life where you do a lot less internet, you need to come to a balance of like still photographing. (laughs) Like you still need memories, Annie. Uh, Yeah. So I took less pictures and I'll tell you a negative thing that I would love for you to speak into. I missed social events in New York Mm, because they were shared on Instagram. And then my friends were like, Hey, why weren't you at that barbecue? And I was like, Oh, I didn't know. And then oh, what put it on Instagram how do we do what, – what, what do I do? That's, hard, that's the hard part, you know? Like I – that's the hard part is that we share online and that's how you get the information. Yeah. So if you go offline completely, you yeah. do miss things. You miss babies being born. You miss yeah. a lot of things. And to that, I wish I had a solution. I've just had to say, okay, how do I – like – how would I want other people to show up for me? And I'm just going to try my best to be that, mm, you know? And like, good. there's this, I would say this whole book is inspired by my mom. It is. If you met her, she would literally be having a blast. She'd be right here. Yeah. 
she'd be playing a kazoo for you or something. Right. Um, and she's so present. And it's crazy because I'm like, I spent so many years trying to get her to get a cell phone. And I don't know why I was telling her to get a cell phone. Yeah. You know, um, she still is an answering machine at home. It's love in Spanish. It. She's not Spanish. Oh, but I love it. She pulled out her little dictionary yeah. and recorded a message. Um, so and. Funny. It's so funny because anybody you talk to, they're like my mom. Like she's such a magical human being. And everybody, she's in her 70s, but everybody wants her to babysit their kids because she's the one that's present with the kids. Wow. And um, there was this moment that was like life shifting for me um, a few years ago where I was with my daughter in Connecticut um, visiting my mom. It was her birthday. And it was that day people kept coming to the door. They kept coming to the door with gifts for her. Somebody had made a cake for her and like a homemade whipped cream. Somebody went to Whole Foods, got all of her favorite snacks. Like a neighbor came from across the street. And I was like, what is going on? And my mom was like, this is just what we do. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is not what we do. Like we Venmo a cup of coffee to somebody. We door dash a meal. But like I think post COVID, we're not showing up at the door. And I remember being like, I don't care if I never do an hour of work again in my life if I don't start doing this right here. This is what matters to me. And I mean, I went home and I started a tradition that I I typically do it with my daughter. But like every week we are carving out space to be available to bless somebody. Oh, wow. And so we either go to the store and we make a care package or, you know, we – the yellow notepads that was yeah. inspired by my friend Misty, who we were like sitting planning for a conference for the passion conference. Yeah, she's writing on a yellow notepad, and I was like, I used to do that, and I loved it, and that's wow. what made me go get them. But yeah. one day we just went to the store, stocked up on yellow notepads, showed up at her work to give them to her. Wow! And so we carve space each week to show up at the door if we can and say, Hey, we're with you. We see you. I'm with you. And I think that's where like. I don't know if that really answered the question. No, that's great. But realizing, okay, if I have an announcement to make, I'm I'm going to do my best to share it in the way that I think is the best way to share it. Yeah. And I could send this as a text, but could I also write a letter and put it in the mail? Mm-hmm. And so figuring out how to be intentional in that way. But I wish I could tell you, hey, you're not going to miss the secret show next weekend. But, but you do. But you do. Yeah. You do. Yeah, that's right. And it was... It, it was a really unique experience this summer because every other summer, it takes me two or three days to not check my phone, to not like open my phone and be like, oh, what are you doing, Annie? You don't even have yeah, Instagram yeah, yeah. right now. And I have like a withdrawal for a little bit. Totally. And then I come back and I'm always like, I don't know if I want. And then I get back in the rhythm. This year, I had zero withdrawal. I was like, get out of here. Like, I didn't miss <laughs> yeah. it for a second. Yeah. And I did not come back until the first podcast released that I had agreed to share about when I was back yeah, at work. you didn't miss it. I didn't miss it at no. all. And except I was sorry that I missed events. And yeah. so I, I listened to eight audiobooks in June. Mm. I listened to one in July. See, yeah. I mean, right? it's just like yeah. it, it, my life tells me everything I need to know about how much the unplug hours make me who I want to be. Yeah. yeah. I just don't always have the self-control to do it. And I think, too, like, because I think for me, because, like, I still show up online, but I stopped, like, posting in the moment. If I think something's awesome, I can take a picture of it and not post it immediately. I actually got, like, a little point-and-shoot camera. Oh, yeah. Which has given me so much joy. You wrote about that, that, like, you started investing in things that were outside of your phone. Yeah. Yeah, And now I show up at, like, people's birthday parties and this and that, and I take photos, and they're awesome photos. Yeah. And, like... That was a piece of me that I had lost when I was in high school pre-documentation days. Like, I'd be the one with the digital camera taking pictures of all our friends. And the reason that anybody has any Facebook profile pictures is because of me, you know. But then it became the thing that's on your phone. And we all know you take a picture. You're not just going to take a picture. You're going to, like, check a banking app. You're going to check an email. You're just going to go from thing to thing to Mm -hmm. thing. And so... Yeah, documentation now I feel like it's more joy-filled because I can still document, but I can still be yes, in the moment, yes, you know? Yes, Wow.
Hey, friends, just interrupted this conversation one more time to tell you about one of our incredible partners, Our Place. Have y'all seen Our Place's cookware? Okay, not only is it cute, but it is non-toxic, which I love. Our Place is a mission-driven and female-founded brand that makes beautiful kitchen products that are healthy and sustainable. Their products are made without PFAS and Teflon. Most of today's nonstick pans contain PFAS, also known as Forever Chemicals, which are under increasing global scrutiny for their impact on the environment and our health. Our producer, Johnny, was the one who was first raving about their products, and he is right. There are so many fun colors to choose from, so many different products, and they're super versatile. And our place is also changing the game by offering non-toxic appliances to y'all. Just go to the website and look at the wonder oven. It's adorable. It's a six-in-one air fryer toaster oven, but it is so cute. I want the blue one so bad. Find out why our place has been mentioned in the New York Times, Bon Appetit, by your friend AFD and more. Go to fromourplace.com and enter our code TSF, like that sounds fun, at checkout, and you'll receive 10% off site-wide. That's fromourplace.com, and the code is TSF. Our Place offers a 100-day trial with free shipping and returns. And now back to finish up this conversation with Hannah. We got a couple minutes left. Talk about monotasking. Oh, monotasking. Because that monotasking is the opposite of what women are told we are most effective at. Right. Right. We, I mean, the, the superpower of women is yeah. multitasking. Mm. So why why monotasking? It's so funny. I literally had a meeting with my functional medicine doctor yesterday. And she's like going through my level. She's like, you're stressed. I'm like, I know I'm stressed. I'm like launching a book. It's yeah, stressful, yeah. you know? And she's like, okay, so like post-launch, we'll do this, we'll do that. And then she just said to me, she goes, you can only juggle one ball at a time. And I was like, no one's ever said that to me because that's not the message or the memo we get as women. It is you can juggle all the balls at all the times. You can wear all the hats. And the more, the more we celebrate you. Yes. And that was so profound to me that I'm still chewing on it. I'm like, one ball at a time? What would that even look like? But that is, in essence monotasking, you know, um, is that I've had to, in order to focus, I've tried to, I do a lot of like time blocks in my work. Um, I've read the data to be like, okay, if I'm going to be watching a show while doing this, I'm not stewarding this as well as I want to be, you know? So I kind of look at it through a lens of stewardship Mm -hmm, because otherwise mm -hmm. it's like, well, what's the harm of like watching a Hallmark movie while I'm doing this? Right. And sometimes that's great and you should do it. Like Christmas in July, Hallmark. But um, I had to say, okay, if I want to do all things to the glory of God, what does this look like in this one task? And usually It's a single-minded focus, and I feel like that's where in my quiet times, like, God has brought me back to again and again and again. It's like, I'm not asking you to take on the whole day. I'm not asking you to take on the whole week. One hour. What are we going to do in this next hour? Yeah. An hour is your currency, and it's a currency within the unplugged hours, but at the same time, it's like, okay, well, if I am going to be showing up to respond to emails, I want to do that intentionally because yeah. there's another human on the other side of it. Right. Same thing if I am going to get on social media, like I try to go in and respond to comments because that was a human that left me a comment. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and so it's releasing our, ourselves, I think, from all of these like performative metrics that have come from the phones because for me, I think – What I thought I was doing was getting away from tech, but what started to fall off of me was this need to do it all, was this need to produce at all times Uh that I realized this is not actually good currency for me. You know, like peace is a much better currency. And if this is not giving me peace, things need to shift. And that doesn't mean much better currency. Yeah, it doesn't mean that like. You know, in a few weeks from now, you're going to have to look back and be like, here's another what's not working list. You know, it's again and again and again. But the piece that I have found has come from, okay, I could do a few things at once, but what would it look like to just be in this one moment and then the next and then the next? And, you know, when I'm unplugged, I'll just like open up my little mole skin. I'll write down the tasks and then I'll just move from one to the other to the other. And it's like you actually end up getting so much more done. Like, Mm. the goal is not productivity, 
But you get so much more done because you're not trying to put your attention in all these different yeah, directions. It's yeah. like, oh, this is what it's like to focus. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm sure you I mean, you may have done this, but I'm sure you've heard this, too. There's a lot of authors who, when we are on book deadlines, uh, <laughs> mute every other author. Because mm. if you are watching someone else release or watching someone else write yeah. 10,000 words today or whatever, it just increases your I can't keep up-ness. Yeah. And... And so one of the things I I notice every year during my Sabbath month when I'm not on social media is I am so satisfied with my life. Right? Yeah. Because I have no idea what everybody else is doing. Yeah. I have no idea what they're getting. I have no idea what they're buying. I have no idea who's engaged or pregnant or whatever or had yeah. a baby. And I have no idea how much people are accomplishing and the new opportunities they are announcing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I am just so happy with the life I have. Yeah. And so that I think that is what you're saying is such a gift. The peace, the currency is so such a gift to me. And it's a different pace. Like, you yeah. know, it's a different pace than what we're used to. But like at the same time, I'm like, OK, but like. That pace was thrust upon us with the age of the internet. Yeah, and it's not right. going to stop. It's going to get right. faster. Like, that's I right. think we're, like, hopeful that we're going to, like, go live in a commune. I'm not sure. But I'm like, no, 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 no. Now we just have robots in it. Yeah. It's going to get worse. Right, right. And so that's where I have to set the pace, you know? Yeah. And it's not the pace that I ran at for years. That's right. And it's not the benchmarks that I was striving for for years because – Newsflash, it never filled me. Yeah. I always wanted more. Yeah. And I feel like now, especially when I go to Power Down, I have like this breath of release where I'm like, it's all right here. Yeah. It's all right here. Yeah. And I get that. I get the comparison and I struggle with that. Yeah, you as write about well. it beautifully. Yeah. But I think too, like that's something that I realized the phone was taking from me when I was too plugged in. It's like, but in any other sphere, if I wasn't overloaded and burned out. Right. I would want to cheer that person on. Right. And right. so can I do that? Can I send them a text? Can I send them? I send voice memos all the time. It probably creeps people out. But like, you know, like I want to be the person that shows up and cheers you on because at, at my core, I love you. Yeah. I may be struggling with comparison, but that's not your fault. Yeah, that's it. That's not, that's why yeah. that's why I don't unfollow any of my friends yeah. when they're <laughs> just I, I just them. mute yeah. them. Yeah. Because it's not about them. Yeah. I want them to win. It's about me yeah. not mm -hmm. being able to keep up with the all the feelings around it. Totally. Dude, this is so important. This is so important. Okay. I what you and I are gonna do here in a second is have a little bit of a side conversation for our single purpose league friends yeah. because there are some unique parts of this for people who do not have a partner mm -hmm. at home. That yep. when they unplug, it isn't my whole life is here. Yeah, yeah. And totally. and so let's have that for Single Purpose League. Um, but I would love for you to kind of like finish us. You, you talk in, uh, let me see if I can just read your, read a quote to yourself. I, uh, what, do you like the Enneagram? I do. I'm a do four. You Your sweetness. Thank <laughs> you for being a four. Aren't we glad you exist? Um, okay, Thank you so for being a seven. As a seven. That sounds uh -huh, fun uh -huh, as a seven. Uh -huh. the, their, um, my tattoo, I have a couple of tattoos, and one of mine says savor this. Mm. Because, and I am like actively trying to do that. I love FaceTiming with my nephew in the morning because someday he'll be 11. Yeah, and he will yeah. not want to watch me do my makeup in the morning while he eats his breakfast. Yeah. But right now he's four and he loves it. And so I'm trying really hard to savor all these things. You write a lot about savoring and and our ability to savor increases in our unplugged hours. Will you talk about that for just a second? Yeah. Um, gosh, it's big because I think for a long time I didn't know that I wasn't savoring mm. we don't talk about savoring i right. feel like maybe in bits and pieces or like at a women's conference but like <laughs> right it's the title of a women's conference yeah, 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 yeah but you know i was always struck by that part in the bible where elizabeth finds out that she's pregnant and then she goes away for five months with god yeah to savor what he had done and yeah. i was like when's the last time i savored anything yeah. i announce it the second it's happened you yeah. know um, and so savoring, I would say, was a slow burn, like a slow discipline that like comes with time. And the more that you unplug or the more that you learn to just be present right where you are in that moment, good, bad, holy, hard, yeah. like that's where you learn the posture of savoring. Mm. And it doesn't have to be extensive. You don't have to do a gratitude journal, though. That's great. Yeah. But like it's like taking those like mental photographs of like. I want to remember this. And I remember that I want to remember that this feeling was 
good enough yes. and that it needed me. And it doesn't mean that it was perfect, but I was here. Yeah. And that yeah. is it's everything. It, yeah. It's that, that, you know, it's like you've experienced it. It's like this is everything right yeah. here. And yeah. I didn't know that I could actually operate the majority of my life in and from that space. Mm -hmm. But yeah, going back to going back to the things that we miss, I think, too, we have to that it comes at the cost of it. Yeah. You do miss out on things. Yeah. But that meant you were somewhere else doing something probably with people you loved or something that you enjoyed. Yeah. And so we have to become OK with missing those things because yeah. that's the thing of the Internet. They want you to be all the places all at once, never yep. miss anything. But in the effort of never missing out, I, I fear we miss out on a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Oh, Hannah, this is so beautiful. Oh, it's so important. It's so important. That's why I'm like, we have to get this episode out to people. Um, in the meantime, they can pre-order the Unplugged Hours before it releases yep. September 17th. Mm -hmm. And what is available right now? If they're like me and like, I mean, I have the unfair advantage that I got to read the book. But if they're like me and they want to like start implementing, what's the what happens if you pre-order? How do we get these uh, worksheets? Yeah. So um, if you pre-order, you will get the first 40 pages of the book. Oh, great. But if you just go on to the website and it's on the book page and on my website at large, you can download the trackers and get started now. Okay. Um, and so don't wait for the book to come out. Start practicing unplugging now and yeah. see the benefits for yourself. Because I've said from the beginning, like, if you read three pages of the book, that's OK. So long as you use the tracker in the book or the trackers that you get offline and you experience this for yourself, because yeah. it truly is it's a gift that I yes. wish I could give to everyone because I've seen it to fruition. And I'm like, oh, yes, there's something to these unplugged hours. And like, it, it's a gift. This is the perfect time, too, because September is when a lot of people are getting back in rhythms. They're getting into healthy yep. rhythms they want. Yeah. Um, we're redoing a month of Let's Read the Gospel. So that's available every day. There is this chance to people are hearing this on Monday, August 26th. So by, spend this week thinking about it. And then really, what are some rhythms you want for September? Yeah. And start yeah. them on September 1. Hannah's book will meet you right in the middle. And then we'll see. You can only know if unplugged hours matter if you do them. Yeah. And just see what happens by October 1st. Like, and you will see it. Yeah. I promise you will see it. Yeah. I mean, I've had so many friends resistant to doing it. And I think it's perfectly encapsulated by my friend Ansley, who was like, I just did my first unplugged hour. And she said... I feel more like myself than I have felt in years. Wow. And I'm like, that. I can't give you that. But like, there's power in this and God is going to meet you in those hours. Yeah. And yeah, I just want to cheer you on. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, friend. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely. Oh, friends, isn't she awesome? Okay, I feel more like normal hearing her talk. I feel like we have tools that we need. I cannot wait for y'all to read this book. Now, it doesn't come out for a little bit, like it's a couple of weeks. So go ahead and pre-order it. While you are waiting for it to arrive, remember you can read the first 40 pages, I think she said, of the Unplugged Hours. And there's also all the resources on her website that you can go ahead and have. So go ahead and order the book. We put the link in the show notes. And you can go ahead and grab all the resources that she already has available for you on her website. Make sure you're following Hannah on social media. Tell her thanks for being on the show and thank you for her wisdom. And if you enjoyed this episode and you, like me, are trying to figure out how do we have healthy rhythms with our phones and with social media, I think you're also going to really enjoy episode 861 with Darren Whitehead and episode 393 with Andy Crouch. And just a reminder to our Single Purpose League friends, there is an entire conversation for you over there about how this is nuanced for us in our singleness. If you haven't joined Single Purpose League, today is a great day to do that. It is singlepurposeleague.com. And starting on Sunday, September 1st, remember we are going through Let's Read the Gospels again. We're going to go through the guided journal and on the podcast. We also have a Facebook group you can join so you can share with each other what stuck out to you each day. It is a great way for the accountability you need to finish all 30 days. So grab your guided journal wherever you love to buy books. Head to the link in the show notes to sign up for the group. Remember, we get started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, John on Sunday. We're actually going to do it the other way, though. We're going to read John, Luke, Mark, and then Matthew starting on Sunday. 
If you have any questions from this episode today, yeah, me too. Let's get a Q&A box going. Um, you can do that in Spotify if you're a Spotify listener or send them to us on Instagram at That Sounds Fun Podcast. We'll try to answer those for you. If you need anything else from me, you know I'm embarrassingly easy to find. Less and less though, less and less as we're getting these boundaries up, right? And I have to write a book. Annie Up Downs on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, anywhere you may need me. That is how you can find me, sort of. <laughs> I think that's it for me today, friends. Go out or stay home. Do something that sounds fun to you and I will do the same. Today, what sounds fun to me, man, I'm not kidding you. I'm so thrilled that we are starting Let's Read the Gospels again. Make sure you're subscribed to that podcast feed and join us whether you've done it before, whether this is your first month ever reading through the gospel account of Jesus's life. This is the month for you. I'm so excited. Y'all have a great week. We'll see you back here on Thursday with your favorite and mine as we recap, drum roll please, or some sort of scary music in the background. We're recapping 2020 with Eddie Koffeltz. We'll see y'all Thursday. That sounds fun. That sounds fun. Oh, that sounds fun. Check one, two on the microphone. And he have downed in your car to your home. Every week it's all the new. A deep talk or an interview. She'll make it laugh. She'll make it cry. When it's dark out, she's a light. Sounds fun. That sounds fun. That sounds fun.